uh, I'm going to try to make a case for a kind of an argument that I have been developing over a couple of years in terms of the role of changing gender roles in shaping family demographic behavior. Uh, and I've made the remarks of a lot of data exemplifying uh, from various research projects I've been running. And I hope they are persuasive in making the case for uh, the positive effects of gender equalization on demographic behavior and, to put it short, to, that families will return stronger, bigger, and better. So, um, this is well known, that in demographic research, we basically have two sets of kind of theoretical arguments about where is the family heading. Uh, the, the second demographic transition, the postmodern uh, thesis, argues in a sense uh, in favor of an ever less strong family scenario. More individualism, more singlehood, fewer kids they get in the way of self organization more divorce and more unstable relationships. Uh, in a way, the Becker framework would lead us to believe something similar. Uh, the whole basis of partnerships and marriage would appear to be weakened considerably uh, given women's new roles. That the whole idea of specialization and the advantages of trade here disappear entirely, or at least to a great extent, and the opportunity cost of children should also rise as women's earnings power increases. So, more or less, the kinds of theoretical tools that we are used to work with are all pointing in the direction of a kind of a seminal, gradual erosion of family as an institution. Uh, the evidence is not particularly strong in favor of either of these views. Uh, and I'm going to start with the macro level. Uh, here is our parity preferences data that a lot of you would know inside out. Uh, uh, the most recent I can find. And what is clear to everybody is that the no kids scenario is very minoritarian. The two plus child norm is as strong today as it basically was for those who entered into adulthood in the 1950s, 60s. There's really not much change in terms of preferences uh, in fertility. Uh, also, if we use attitudinal data related to family and family preferences uh, from global value studies and so forth and so on, here this is where this data come from. Uh, these kind of postmodern attitudes don't seem to be there. Uh, they seem actually to be even less present in countries that are most advanced in terms of women's new roles, Scandinavia being exemplified here, uh, where the percentage that believe that marriage is an old fashioned passe thing is very minoritarian. The percent who say that children get in the way of life or they don't want children is a tiny, tiny minority. But notice, in more gender traditional countries, you actually have higher rates of um, uh, shunning marriage and higher rates also of not wanting children. So it seems to go exactly opposite of what either the uh, SDT the theorist would say or the a Beckerian would predict. In this Continues. If you line up uh, fertility, these are TFRs averaged over three years, uh, relatively recent. Uh, again, you see the countries that are most advanced in terms of the new role of women have substantially higher fertility than the countries that cling to the traditional role of women to a far greater extent, such as Germany and I think also uh, the country we're right now sitting or standing in. And it holds for divorce. And here, I just take the crude divorce rate and the trends over the past, well, it's, a, it's a, uh, almost 20 years, uh, all basically going down in gender, we got a more gender egalitarian societies, moving in the gender inegalitarian societies. 
And this is where I begin to believe our data that begin to point in a direction that fits much better my own argument. Namely, that uh, the decline in family was associated with the coming of the new roles of women. But once society, and in particular partnerships, adjust in terms of greater gender egalitarianism, gender symmetry in their behavior, then you're going to have a return because preferences have now changed. And that's what this story I'm going to now try to make. I have very little time, so I'm a little bit racing here, uh, but uh, that, you know, many of you are probably taking a nap. <laughs> Uh, the first thing we note, and I think there are going to be quite a few papers on that here in this conference, is that the social gradient of demographic behavior is turning upside down. Uh, that is clear in terms of divorce propensity or partnership instability. Uh, it used to be so that it was the high educated that were much more unstable in the partnerships than the low educated. Uh, so if we go back to the 1970s, uh, we find, as you see here, both in Sweden and in Germany, we don't have data for Denmark there, in, that the low educated were more stable, or I suppose that the high educated were not more stable. That starts changing in the 90s, and the trend consolidates even further as we move into the new millennium. Uh, and this is uh, exemplified here by a handful of countries. But the trend is pretty much visible if we were to extend the sample of countries uh, further than this. We also see it uh, when we look in one particular country, the US, where it just do couple of miles here over 25 years, where I can use the PSID data to do it. Uh, I don't know if you can see very well, but the, the graph up in the top are the top of the top the quantile of the population, and here is the bottom quantile of the population. And the distance is just growing and growing as people march from one year to the next year in their partnerships, uh, and the divorce propensities are just very, very large, for e and rising for each year of marriage. <coughs> the trend we see pretty much also in other countries. So we are seeing this, uh, what, what uh, was hinted at earlier, sort of a, a polarizing trend on many counts in terms of how families fare and families behave. Uh, another way to illustrate the same, again using US data, and it would be even more sharply uh, uh, clear in Scandinavia, is how across marriage cohorts, uh, varied in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, by education, what the divorce trend goes on. And if you go back to the 70s, there was really no difference between the high and low educated in terms of their divorce propensity. It starts widening as we go through uh, su subsequent cohorts. And it becomes quite dramatic in terms of the difference as we move into the cohorts married in the 1990s. Uh, if there should be a gender egalitarianism effect on demographic behavior, the question has very much to do with the diffusion of the acceptance and integration of gender egalitarian or gender symmetric roles and opinions and views and values in society. Uh, it would come as a very little surprise to anyone that it is uh, to a large extent, the higher educated professional type social classes that are the avant-garde of more gender egalitarian uh, views. Uh, I've done a test here to using Denmark, which is sort of a glorious case of leading country in terms of gender equalization, and taken three cohorts uh, of <coughs> partnerships. It includes both cohabiting and married couples. Uh, and I look at if the woman becomes the dominant earner, that is, she accounts for more than 55% of the couple's income, over at least minimum two years. So I have a kind of a tough criterion for female dominance. 
Now, as you see, as we compare these cohorts, when she crosses that line for two years, uh, there is a higher uh, divorce propensity here in terms of odds ratios. Uh, for the highly educated, though, it goes sharply down and is virtually neutral for the latest cohort. But look how big it was for the low educated back in the 1981 cohort, an odds ratio of 6.2 times. And this is actually uh, estimated with selection models in the whole Japan. And then declining very, very sharply. So the ratio between the high and low educated has diminished very, very clearly. I have done exactly the same model with Swedish data, which is a bit more tricky because in Sweden you cannot identify easily cohabitant people in the registry data. But it comes out pretty similar. Uh, so in Scandinavia, you can see that the low educated are beginning also to move into the gender egalitarian kind of scenario that the higher educated already have entered into uh, earlier diffusion process that seems to have gone quite far. I have very much for some years now advocated a multiple equilibrium approach and Alexia has actually uh, been suffering from that a lot. Uh, uh, that I think is a very useful analytical tool to handle this kind of uh, decline and then potential resurgence of family. Uh, now, the starting point would be in the old days of the traditional male breadwinner family, the housewife model, that was uh, indulgently self-reproduced equilibrium in the sense that people, as they were young, already assumed that they would be entering into that traditional role either as housewife specializing in the skills of housewifery or as a male specializing in male breadwinner skills and trying to optimize that. A uh, model that was reproduced from cohort to cohort over time. If that equilibrium begins to disintegrate, and that is an exogenous shock, and I'm going to get to what that is, there is where you would expect that you would have unstable, what economists call unstable equilibrium, a very bad term, but normlessness if you're a sociologist. And the question is, once you have moved out of the old equilibrium, how are you going to get a process of diffusion accelerating towards the consolidation of a new, and in my case, gender egalitarian or gender symmetric type of family equilibrium. So here are the basic points of the dynamics of equilibrium change. <coughs> Stable equilibrium would be endogenously reproduced unless there are exogenous shocks coming at it from outside. I think Golden, Miriam Golden, the economist, has pinpointed very well what were these shocks. The pill, women could control their fertility. Household technologies, you didn't need uh, eight hours a day to clean pots and pans and clean the house and iron shirts. And female education, which is exogenous from the individual point of view, is uh, obviously not at the societal level. That meant that uh, women started moving into a new preference set. Uh, as I said, you will probably, uh, in this kind of situation with eroding old equilibrium or norms, you will have norm normative confusion that will tend to produce Pareto suboptimal outcomes, inefficiency, and also inequities. Think of the uh, double shift woman. Career on the one side and coming home and having to do most of the housework at the same time. Inequitable and inefficient. And the consolidation of the new equilibrium requires this kind of indulgence for a produced uh, diffusion process of ever greater acceptance of a new the universally shared norm of how to do family. And my thesis, as I said, is that gender egalitarianism should probably be at the core of this new equilibrium or normative change. So what can we identify in terms of egalitarianism behind the four walls of the house? 
Uh, here I took three countries, Denmark, UK, Spain, countries that are very different situated on the wave of gender egalitarian uh, dynamics. And uh, these are relative, quite recent uh, data from time use surveys. And here you see that more than half of the Danish men are pretty much already egalitarian in terms of the division of uh, domestic chores. Uh, and indeed, 30% of Danish men do more than 50%. Uh, they are truly boy scouts. Or some hyper egalitarians. <laughs> uh, compare that to Spain or, or, or Britain, uh, it's very clear that uh, Denmark is much further ahead in terms of the acceptance of this. So what is it? it some people, certainly if you're Danish, you might say, well, Danes are superior beings, and that's why we are so gender egalitarian. I don't think a lot of you would buy that argument. Uh, I might be the only one to do so. <laughs> so you have to look for uh, what else might be a driver in terms of the diffusion and the male acceptance and walking readily into an egalitarian, equitable sharing and at the level of partnerships. Uh, and I've run regressions here in terms of uh, the likelihood of uh, contributing, and the interesting thing here would be contributing more than 40% compared to being the traditional male uh, doing nothing. And the one variable, whatever you put in there, uh, female education, male education, of course they matter, but the one that really says bang is when the woman becomes a full-time woman. It is that transition that really triggers and it, it comes out again and again in whatever, whatever I have done with the data. It is when the full-timer status of women is become consolidated as the norm. And I think that is what explains the Scandinavian thrust and leadership here. I, this one I'm, I'm going to skip because I think I'm running out of time. So, do I have any evidence I could show you that would bolster my argument that uh, gender, more gender egalitarian adoption in terms of normative, in terms of behavior, will also produce more positive some outcomes in terms of family demographic behavior. Um, here is one illustration of it, it's a recent paper that we did, uh, looking at the movement over uh, the last 30 or so years uh, in terms of the link between levels of gender egalitarianism uh, using uh, uh, attitudinal data. Um, that the question here that we use in, in the value service is uh, when jobs are scarce, with men should have first uh, right to, to a job. Uh, and those who say yes to that are of course not gender egalitarian. Um, when we plot that against the TFRs, um, what you see way back in the earliest data we have, 1990, we can't go further back, we have a lot of countries with high fertility and very little gender egalitarianism. Illustrated there with Latvia, uh, Poland, Bulgaria. Uh, and then we have that kind of U-shaped curve where again, you have a couple of countries with high levels of gender egalitarianism, the usual suspects called Denmark, Sweden, Iceland, Norway, uh, also exhibiting uh, high fertility. As we move 10 years, sort of, yeah, about 10, a decade ahead, the whole curve starts shifting in upward to the right. Diffusion. There are almost no countries left with low, low gender equality and high fertility. They have, those countries have disappeared. Uh, and they're beginning to move up towards a high gender egalitarianism, high fertility scenario. And that is even more clearly pronounced as we move into the latest data we have with you from 2008-9. So here we see a diffusion at the macro level across countries uh, where the link seems to go exactly in that direction that we expect, and it actually fits quite nicely with that U shaped curve that I theoretically presented a little before. Here is also 
other evidence, uh, this is some of the latest stuff uh, we've been doing, where we looked at a lifelong singlehood among women and thought that might be a very nice indicator also of uh, problems of reconciling, uh, problems of, of, of finding partners that are acceptable, and in particular, of course, among higher educated professional or career oriented women. Uh, they may have difficulties in that situation I described as an unstable equilibrium or normative confusion or lack of adaptation to more gender egalitarian behavior. There is where you would expect that uh, unpartnered or lifelong singlehood would be especially pronounced. So I ran this, or uh, as I say, we ran this uh, with three, sorry, four, yeah, four types of women. Uh, high educated are the ones um, that, that the top curve up there. There was a high educated, but we broke the high educated into two groups. High educated coming, uh, we, distinguishing one group that's high educated but coming from low educated socioeconomic backgrounds. And they actually are distinct from the, from the high educated, high educated group. Quite so. Probably, and what emerges in our data is that they tend to be more traditional in their views. And that is the ones with the small dotted line up there. Uh, and the low educated are the solid line down the bottom. And what we see here, oh, again, as and this has been cross-national uh, approach very similar to the one I just did with fertility, but now life on singlehood, you find a U-shaped curve that is very clearly for the high educated, less accentuated, but that also emerges for the high educated from low SES backgrounds. That is, as gender egalitarianism was very, very minor, you don't have a particular pronounced education correlation of lifelong singlehood. It starts booming somewhere in the middle levels, and then as you get consolidation up towards almost universal acceptance of gender egalitarianism, you have a nice sharp drop of lifelong singlehood, uh, especially among the high educated from high educated SES backgrounds. Another <laughs> evidence, I believe, that supports the idea that once gender egalitarianism becomes kind of a universally accepted norm of how to do family and how to behave as partners, this is where you can have a return of the family. And that is the last evidence I'm going to bore you with today. <laughs> I hope I made it in time. Uh, more than in time.